Well, good morning and welcome to worship on this beautiful Lord's Day. It's always good to be gathered uh, in the house of the Lord for worship, but it's especially good uh, on a baptism Sunday. And so we're, we're looking forward to seeing Kelly Shepherd baptized later in the service. And uh, we're glad to have his family here just to support him through that. So thank you guys for being here. I want to have a special welcome to those who are also watching on Facebook Live. Uh, just let us know where you're watching from. Just throw something in the comments uh, just to let us know you're out there. Uh, and if we have any prayer requests or anything like that we could do for you, uh, please leave a comment, send us a message. Uh, we would love to specifically pray over those for you. Well, let's stand up and greet each other in the name of Christ this morning. You may be seated. I have a handful of announcements for us this morning, and like usual, I'm going to run straight through them. If you need me to repeat any of them after the service, I'd be glad to do so. Uh, this evening from 6 to 7.15, we have RBC Youth, so youth, uh, don't forget about youth tonight from 6 to 7.15. Uh, if you're looking for ways that you could help out with the youth group, uh, we have a sign-up sheet outside of Joy's office uh, for meals, if you think you want to... Uh, bring a 12-pack of tacos, or I guess for these youth, a 24-pack of tacos. If you wanted to run out and get something, uh, come see the youth, kind of interact with them. Uh, that would be a great way to do so. Um, so again, there's a contact sheet uh, outside of Joy's office, uh, and if you need any more information on that, uh, just reach out to me or Rachel, and we'd be glad to give you some more information on that. I wanted to remind you of our small groups. Uh, on Monday, we have one that meets at 11 a.m., on Tuesdays, we have two small groups, one from 6 to 7 p.m. and one, from, or one at 6.30. Uh, and then we have one uh, on Wednesdays at 6.15 p.m. And speaking of Wednesdays, we have our family night supper that precedes that small group at 5.45. Um, I believe I saw ham on the menu, and so that's going to be a good meal. I saw ham and mac and cheese, and I was excited for it. So that's going to be on the menu for this Wednesday. Uh, just rip out the little piece in your bulletin with how many you have you, you're going to have attend and drop them in the offering plates. I think there's two of them up here and one towards the back. Uh, we'd love to have you join us. And again, that rolls right into our small group uh, led by Molly Wallace of Bad Girls of the Bible and RBC Kids is at 615. Following that is our choir rehearsal at 7 p.m. On this Thursday at 7 p.m., we have a deacons meeting in the Fellowship Center. So deacons uh, will be meeting there at 7 p.m. in the Fellowship Center. I think we're going to keep rolling with special Sundays for the rest of October. Uh, next week, we're going to have a deacon ordination. Jim Lord uh, is going to be ordained um, next Sunday. And so we're looking forward to that opportunity uh, to worship together and to ordain Jim and celebrating that with him and his family. So please make note to come out for that. On Sunday, October 30th, uh, we have our trunk or treat at the Hattie Colum Center. Uh, it's going to run from 5 to 7 p.m. Uh, and so you could help in, let's say we can, you could help in three ways. One, we would love to have you come out and decorate a car. So if that is something that, that interests you, you could reach out to me or Rachel. And we'd love to give you more information. Uh, we had a good turnout last year for that. So um, as many cars as we could get would be awesome. Uh, the other thing is candy. We would love to have some candy, obviously. We've got to have a lot of that to hand out. Uh, so if you want to donate in that way, there is a little, um, I can't think of the word, basket is the word I want to use. There's a basket outside of Joy's office that you could just place uh, bags of candy there. They're not too picky, so whatever you bring, they'll probably eat, so, or I'll end up eating it. But either way, so you could come out for that. And the third is that you could pray. You could just pray that uh, God would be present with us, and God would bring out kids who, uh, who need a little bit of love uh, on that uh, Sunday evening. So again, uh, you could help out in those three ways. Uh, the last announcement that I have is the security team will not meet tomorrow evening, uh, and we will reach out to you when we reschedule that time. All right, I think that's enough announcements for me today.
Father, in your goodness and grace, we come to you acknowledging your holiness. We come to you grateful for your love. We come to you grateful for Christ Jesus. And we come to celebrate baptism today. Lord, as we worship you through this act of baptism and as we worship you in the act of worship, we pray that you would bless our time. We, we pray that you would call our minds to you and your goodness and your truth. And help us to put away every wicked way within us and help us draw ever nearer to Christ. For it is in his name and in the power of the Spirit we pray. Amen. This morning, it is my privilege to present to you a candidate for baptism, Ms. Kelly Shepard. Kelly uh, and I got to know each other playing basketball um, for the RBC te team, and he became a regular at worship with us when we were worshiping in the parking lot, and uh, he and uh, Michelle have uh, been faithful, and Kelly, many weeks ago now, said he wanted to obey the Lord's command and baptism. And so we present him as a candidate for baptism this morning. All right. Kelly, do you acknowledge God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit? Yes. Have you asked Jesus Christ into your life and to forgive you of your sins? Do you commit your life to following him? Now all of you who are willing to walk the Christian life with Kelly and support him and pray for him as he journeys in Christ, will you stand with me? Kelly, this is your new family, the family of faith. Kelly, on your profession of faith, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. stand together as we sing a wonderful hymn, The Family of God, because we're so grateful that Kelly is part of the family of God now. Let's stand. Our scripture reading this morning comes from Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 10. I'm going to be reading it out loud for us, but you could follow along on the screens behind me or in the Bibles in the pew pocket in front of you. Again, Romans chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning that, so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For we have, if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. 
Now we're going to turn our attention to the screens behind me. We're going to have an a Operation Christmas Child video. The collection date for that uh, for us is November 6th on that Sunday. Uh, and this really just shows uh, how shoeboxes are more than what you just see up here. You go out, you run to the dollar store, you run to Walmart, you buy those gifts, you set them here, and sometimes we could tend to forget uh, the impact that they can make and how those simple shoe boxes can reach somebody with the gospel. And so this video is going to show us a little bit more about that this morning. I could have all of our children come up for our children's time this morning. <laughs> Re 
Rebecca, Victoria, y'all didn't feel like running this morning? <laughs> I'm just messing, I'm just messing. So how are y'all doing? Good. Yeah, I know you're, you're doing fantastic, aren't you, Ainsley? So what did we just witness up there a minute ago? All the way up there, right underneath that cross. My daddy up there. Someone getting baptized. Yes, your daddy was up there. He was baptizing Mr. Kelly. Yeah. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. We're going to talk a little bit this morning about what baptism is, okay? And we're going to talk a little further in children's church. But it was so cool to look at Mr. Kelly up there getting baptized. Do you think he was nervous? No. You don't think he was nervous? No. Kelly, you did a good job, buddy. Yeah. Oh, thumbs up over there. You, you saw him yesterday. That's pretty awesome. So, that's awesome. So the Bible tells us that when we invite Jesus into our heart, we are born again. And that is something that is so exciting that we want to tell everybody about what Jesus has done. But we just don't want to tell them about it. We want to show them about it. And that's what baptism is. It is a picture of what Jesus has done for us. And it shows the world that just as Jesus has died and he was buried and rose again, our old self has died, our past has been buried, and we have been born again and raised to a new life in Jesus. And so that's what Mr. Kelly was showing all of us today, that inward change, that inward calling on his life to accept Jesus as his Savior. And that's an opportunity that we all have um, as humans on this earth uh, to have that opportunity. So we're going to pray about that uh, before we go to Children's Church, and we'll go over there, okay? So let's pray. Dear God, thank you so much for Jesus. Thank you that he has shown us a way to show others what happens when we put our trust in you. Help us to tell others about you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.
Let's pray together. And now, O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and redeemer. Amen. This morning, as I was stepping into the water and knocking a few bits of ice off of my nose from the shiver inside, um, I had reason to recall my baptism. I was a kid. I think I was 12, give or take. And I remember feeling more than a little bit nervous. And I suppose that's natural. Most of us, when we encounter something that is sacred, will have a little bit of, a little bout of nervous. And of course, when I was little, I, I wasn't quite sure how to make all that fit. Um, and part of me was like, uh, maybe I'm nervous because God's going to zap me because I haven't been good enough since I've been Christian yet. And of course, that's silly. But I remember nervousness. I remember the young man who was being baptized the same day I was. His name was Chad. And uh, I remember he did not seem to have the same nervousness as I did, and perhaps it was just me. I remember the pastor, when we went to his office, and he made sure for probably the third or fourth time in the weeks preceding baptism that we heard what baptism was all about. I have come to find baptism a beautiful and wonderful thing. I've come to find baptism to be we Baptists have a way of putting things, and we Baptists tend to talk about baptism as if it means nothing. It is just just a symbol, we'll say. And yes, it is a symbol, but there's power in symbols. How many of you who have ever graduated uh, from anything, but particularly something that you had to work really hard to achieve, did not really want the symbol of the diploma so you could hang it on your wall. How many of you who have gotten married choose to wear a ring, which is a symbol of your vow? We have symbols all over the church. You have symbols all over your home. You may not even think of them as such. Some of you collect spoons from the places you have visited. Uh, others of you, I, have, I am sure, collect a little piece of dirt and have that little map of little vials of dirt from all 50 states. I mean, you have symbols all over your home and life because they mean something. And so baptism means something very good. In a sense, baptism means everything that water means. Water means life. When we, gather, when we work outside on a hot summer day, water is life, that brief moment. Water is what, how we clean our food, how we clean ourselves. So water is cleansing. Water is power. Before electricity was common, we would power um, mills with the turning of water over a wheel. Water is the power of the ocean throwing waves upon the shore. Water is the power of the rain bringing life to us. All of that is true. But water is also a negative force. Too much water can cause flooding. Water can be a cause of injury or even worse. Baptism encompasses all of that. It is the water of life. It is the water of death. It is the water of God. There is a great tension in the Christian life. There is a tension between law and grace. It is the law that says to us, we have done that which is wrong. And it is the grace that tells us God has saved us anyway. The tension is reflected in our text this morning, and it starts out, we're going to pick up a little bit earlier in our text, uh, in Romans 5, chapter uh, it's 5, verse 21. So that as sin reigned until death, grace might also reign through righteousness leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
So what Paul is saying is sin and death reigned in our lives, and because of that, Christ came into the world, and he came in the world with the power of salvation. Jesus Christ saves us from the curse, saves us from the law of sin and death. In his power, he has overcome death and the grave. And so the penalty of sin we bear no more. And when we sin, grace is all the more powerful than our sin to overcome it and overwhelm it and make us whole again. That is the gospel. Too many people in hearing the good news of the gospel will think something like, well, sin is bad, but grace is good. And if grace is good and sin brings grace, why not sin all we want and we'll keep bringing more and more and more grace? Paul has none of that argument. But it almost sounds trite to us, but understand Paul was dealing with people who couldn't get it. People all over the place would hear Paul say, grace triumphs over sin, and, say, and hear him say that you can do whatever you want, and grace will fix it. You don't have to worry about how you live anymore because of grace. They would hear Paul saying that, even though Paul wasn't. Some people, to protect that, would try to reinstitute the law and say, if you want to be Christian, you have to follow all the Hebrew law, including regulations of what you eat and what you wear, and, and on and on and on. Paul says, no. But Paul also teaches us that grace, while powerful over sin, does not give us an excuse to sin. In baptism, something happens. Baptism is a very old thing. It actually is older than the Christian faith itself. Before, uh, before Jesus even began his public ministry, there was a fellow named John the Baptist, probably best translated John the Baptizer, and he was baptizing people by the river for the forgiveness of sin. And this rite became the initiation rite of Christianity. When someone is baptized, they are be being initiated into the whole of the faith. The question for us, any fair-minded person reading the text, is simple. What about Jesus? Why was Jesus baptized? Jesus had no sin of which to repent for. Jesus baptized as a way of foreshadowing. When, you're, when Jesus enters the water of the River Jordan, he identifies with us in our life, and he takes on our sin, is the image of him doing that. He goes under the water, it is the image of death. And he comes up, it's the image of his resurrection. In Jesus' baptism, he is identifying with us. Now, it is quite proper for us to think of baptism as something that God does. God is the initiator of baptism. It is God who drew us to faith. It is the Holy Spirit of God which made us aware that we needed a Savior. And the Holy Spirit calls us to baptism. And the Holy Spirit is present with us when we are being baptized. There is a human element of baptism, though, and it is something we do. And Paul says it this way. We are to stop presenting our bodies as an instrument of sin. In other places, he describes it as us no longer being mastered by sin. So Paul's answer to the problem of grace and law isn't anything short of saying, you, in your profession of faith, in Jesus Christ coming into your life, you have now died to sin. It is impossible for those who have died to sin to continue to live in sin. If you're dead to it, you can't live in it. Have you ever had someone in your family or have you ever known someone to be completely estranged from a family member and it's like they are dead to each other? Well, if they're dead to each other, they can't keep running around in the same circles. I'm over here, you're over here. We're going our separate ways. We are dead to each other because that relationship is dead. If we continue to run in the same circles and continue to have a relationship with one another, the relationship isn't dead. If 
If we are in Christ, we are called to be dead to sin. One of the great failings of the modern Christian life is we don't take sin seriously enough. Oh, when we see other people sin, we can get really judgy about it. And other people sin, and we're like, ooh, look at them. Look what they did. What kind of rotten rascal must they be? And maybe, maybe I need to talk about this with my 14 cousins and their friends, and we'll just have a big old time. We can get really, really judgy when other people sin. But when we do it, it's a mistake. It's someone else's fault, or it's no big deal. This happens in my life a lot. The other day, sweet little Ainsley got in trouble. I was cleaning up the house, and I noticed that she had taken a magic marker to the top of one of my cabinets. I mean, it's the white area, it's the flat area going into the bookshelf. And I looked at it, and I said, Ainsley, did you do that? No, Abby did it. Well, first of all, it's a little too high for Abby to do it. And second of all, the coloring on the countertop was a bit too advanced for Abby to be done it, doing it. It was a squiggly line going back and forth. And if Abby gets a whole other thing, it's just a gigantic scribble. Abby couldn't have done it. Ainsley blamed. Abby did it. Ainsley, Abby didn't do that, did she? No. I sorry, Daddy. Okay, this is the 14th time you've been coloring on the cabinets. You're not really sorry at this point. She couldn't get away from it. it. She couldn't blame someone else. She couldn't say she hadn't been warned. She couldn't say it wasn't a big deal because clearly my hair was nearly on fire at this point with my sweet little child. No. I saw we, Daddy. But at some point, I'm sorry, Daddy, isn't really enough, is it? I mean, if she does something that she's not supposed to all the time and she says that she's sorry and nothing happens, is she really sorry? God judges our sin, human sin. And yes, there is a wrath in God. Not my favorite subject, never has been. It's still true. A great theologian described it this way, Wrath is the negative side of God's love. And what he means by that is love requires wrath. What kind of father would I be if the things that harmed my children I didn't try to stop? What kind of God would he be if he sat idly by when we are living in destructive patterns? In fact, God's judging is the initial act of God's saving. How does he save us from our sin if he doesn't tell us it is, if he doesn't stop us? God's grace is God's salvation from the evil that would destroy us. And so what we do, how we live, we live a life of repentance. Now, repentance is one of those words that gets thrown around in churches a lot. And growing up, I associated that word with um, kind of hothouse revival meetings with a a red-faced preacher dabbing the sweat off his forehead with a, with a handkerchief and loosening his tie and screaming about the oncoming wrath of God. And then tearfully people would come to the front and repent of their sins. And, huh. I have to say, though, that hothouse emotionalism is not the worst thing. The worst thing is us not taking sin seriously enough at all. I would rather us come to terms with our sin and what our sin does and maybe even weep a little bit than to just pretend it doesn't matter. You cannot fully appreciate the the grace of God until you know the brokenness of sin. Some writers will describe sin as an offense to God. Usually those writers are from the Middle Ages and they would think of a king whose honor had had been offended and somehow that honor would have to be restored. And that restoration would either take place through the punishment of the, uh, 
the, afflict, the offending party or someone to take its place, and Jesus Christ takes the place. When I tend to talk about sin, I think of it as a debt. Sin, and there's a reason for that. Forgiveness in the Bible is actually a financial term. And it's borrowed right from loan forgiveness. If someone forgives your debt, you are relieved of it. So when I think of sin, I think of piling up massive amounts of debts that I can't afford to pay, and all of a sudden those payments come after me, and I, I can't make those payments anymore, and, and the burden is too heavy. I owe all of this, and I cannot pay it, and Jesus Christ pays it for me. Sometimes we can talk about sin as a rupture. If you were doing something that you knew was causing a rupture between you and your loved ones, what would you do? Hopefully you would stop. Sin can be thought of as an attack on creation. Creation, of course, includes you and other people and the cosmos itself. We have a mistaken notion of how we live and that what we do privately doesn't matter. Nothing could be further from the truth. There is no such thing as a private sin. There is no such thing as a sin that doesn't affect the whole of humanity. It affects you. It affects the people that are closest to you. And by extension, it affects everyone. And so we should think of sin as a destructive and irrational power. The Bible frequently talks about lust of the flesh, and it doesn't use that term the way you and I might. When the Bible talks of lust, it's referring to irrational craving, irrational desires. You know, the thing that in your life that you crave, and you know very well if you get it, it will harm you, and you still crave it and you can't let it go, and you feed your craving, and you nurture your craving, and you give in to your craving whenever you can. For those of you who don't know, I have a, a physiological condition. I have a high cholesterol level. And I know very well the things that affect it. And I don't care. I know very well that come lunch, I will have my eye on dessert. And if we do what we normally do for lunch, I will be sitting in front of a ginormous pile of Chinese donuts. And I know very well that I shouldn't be eating these things because, as I told you, I have a health condition. And you know what? I don't care. I should, but I don't. It's irrational. I get it. And somehow, I can't get my mind around the fact that I have to change. We live in a weird world where what is good is now wrong and what is wrong is now right and everything's upside down. And people make it seem like what is rational is to participate in the rat race where we have to gain more and more stuff to be acceptable. That what matters is what we can get for ourselves, what we can do in our body while other people perceive us. And what we are doing to ourselves is destructive. We are less happy than we were 50 years ago, statistically speaking. Now I want you to think of this. 50 years ago, I, did not have, well, I would not have had 300 channels on my television set. I would not have, not have had Netflix. Fifty years ago, many of us didn't have air conditioning in our homes. We had ceiling fans. Fifty years ago, if I wanted something sweet, I had best pick it up at the grocery store on Friday, or chances are I wouldn't have had the funds to do it by the weekend. We live longer and healthier. We have more creature comforts. We have more money. Our conveniences have conveniences. Once upon a time, 
Well, if you're of a certain age, you won't even remember this. Every phone was attached to the wall by a cord. And now we have telephones that fit in our pockets. But not only that, our telephone in our pocket is also our calculator, our computer. It's also our, our camera. It also connects us to the Internet and will be a map for us when we get lost. All while playing our favorite music at the same time. Our conveniences have conveniences. And you would think all of these things would make for a happier life. We're not happier. Why? Because persistently giving in to our irrational desires cannot make us happy. Oh, they can give us pleasure for a moment or two. They cannot make us happier long term. Happiness is not born of these things. Happiness is born of a right relationship with God and a right relationship with the people around us. And we cannot have that happiness if we live irrationally. So today it is urgent for you to do something. Reflect seriously on your life. What sins do you refuse to let go of? You don't have to tell me or anyone else. Just prayerfully say, Lord, what areas of my life need correction? Where is your life going off course? What are the irrational desires you refuse to clean up? And then do something about them. Over the last many weeks and months, I have gotten to know Kelly and Michelle very well. And I have enjoyed every bit of it. Kelly, the first time I met him, was on a basketball court. And as a person who loves sports, not just basketball, but I think just about every sport, Kelly knows what I'm about to say is true. You cannot expect to be a better basketball player three months from now if you don't pick up the ball today. You can't. You cannot expect to grow in the spiritual life if you don't do the work today. And yes, part of that work is staring seriously in the mirror and saying these things must go and I'm going to get rid of them. And perhaps they're hard, and that's fine. Perhaps right now you don't feel like you have the power to overwhelm them, but you have to say, Lord, and your grace and your mercy, I need your help. The spiritual life is not one where we make a commitment to Jesus Christ one day and we live the rest of our lives comfortable as things are. No, the spiritual life is a life of consistent improvement. And so... We ask for help. I think that is one of the most beautiful things about baptism is that it is a physical reminder of a spiritual event. Kelly and I probably will never think about baptism again the same way after stepping in the waters this morning. They was cold. I mean, that, wow. Wow. So the next time cold water splashes across Kelly's face, Kelly, I want you to remember the grace of God. When you're outside playing basketball with the kids and you just need to cool off and you take a cool swallow of water, remember the grace of God. And those of you who, after a long day's work, step into a warm shower and feel the warm water flow over you, and you know how it is. You spend two minutes washing yourself and 20 minutes solving the problems of the world as you stand under the hot water. Remember the grace of God. Every time you jump into a swimming pool in the summer or throw a line in the lake or the ocean, remember the grace of God. You can touch something that reminds you. God's grace is real. And whatever you've done, 
God's grace is real. And the same God who calls us to repentance for the things that we've done is the God who provides us grace and assurance that knows and lets us know that we, he will be with us no matter what. That the sins we've committed have not overwhelmed his grace and we will never be outside of his grace. The same God who calls us to live rightly and rationally is with us every step of the way. Even when we fail. Because God is good. And God loves you. We stand here today as recipients of the most amazing thing. The love of God. God has no need. God is perfectly content being God. It is one of the interesting differences in personality between Molly and me. My work will have me frequently in quiet time reading and studying and praying and making short visits with people. Molly is a teacher, and so she is frequently spending all day in front of people. And so what Molly needs when she comes home is quiet. And what I need when I get home is somebody to talk to. It, it, it really is an interesting dynamic to think through. God has need of neither. He has need neither of quiet nor of others. God did not need this creation. And he did it. God did not need to spawn life on planet Earth. And he did. God did not need a relationship with any human being at any time. But he chose it. God had no need to rescue us from our sin through Jesus Christ. But he did. God had no need for us in heaven, but he wants us there. Why? Because of his great love for you, the creator of the universe, the sustainer of all life, the giver of all grace, has called you and me to him. This is the most astounding thing. God is love, and he has directed that love to you and me. And we experience that love through grace. But we are reminded of that love in the water of life, the water of baptism. Thanks be to God for his infinite mercy and grace. And thanks be to God for his call to you. And if you know that call, the rational thing to do is to present your very life as an offering to him. And I would encourage you to do just that right now. Let's pray together. Holy Father, we are, are so amazed by your love and grace. We are so amazed by the Christ who has come and called us. And so we ask for forgiveness of our sin. We ask for the power to deal seriously with the sin in our own lives. We ask for your mercy and power to overcome the evil that so easily puts us down. Help us to cling to the water of life, to drink it, to share it, to love it. For we make this prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. Our hymn of invitation is hymn number 317, Only Trust Him. The invitation is Christ's. And the response is yours as we stand.
I'm going to ask Kelly and Michelle if you'll come down here and we're going to let people greet you as they leave. Kelly, I have your, a certificate of baptism for you to remember this day. Um, and I, please welcome him to the family of faith. You are such a good community of faith. And uh, I know you will welcome him in as you have with others who have joined and have welcomed him in since you've been in worshiping in the car with us. So we, we, we praise God for what he has done in your life. Let's bow now and receive the benediction. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Through Jesus we pray. Amen.